Our scripture reading for the day is Genesis 44, verse 31 to 34. If the congregation can please arise and we can read this together. Genesis 44, verse 31 to 44. Sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of your father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come on my father. You may be seated. It's a privilege to be here to, today to um, worship with you. And um, it's always good to be with the family wherever we are in the world, and um, it's, it's a real privilege to be able to share this time with you. Brother Yoon was a Christian Chinese. He was in prison for his faith in Jesus and um, also as an active soul winner of the Chinese people. He was one of the organizers of the underground churches house churches back in the 1980s and 1990s. He was often there in prison beaten severely and abused. And one day, the director of the prison called to him, him to the office and offered him a padded chair and tea. The prison director said, Yoon, I know you believe in Jesus, Today, I've decided to give you a special assignment. Now, usually, when the prison director would be nice to the prisoners, it was because they wanted him to report on another prisoner or they wanted to, him to renounce his ways. Instead, the prison director continued, in cell number nine, is a murderer named Huang. Every day, he tries to kill himself. He is crazy and tries to bite other prisoners. We've decided to send him to your cell. From now on until the day he is executed, we want you to watch over him and make sure that he doesn't harm himself or any other prisoners. If you don't remain alert and he kills himself, we're going to hold you fully responsible. Immediately, Brother Yoon felt Huang was a precious soul whom God wanted to save. So he went back to his cell and he broke the news to his cellmate. The opposition was formidable. One prisoner said, he's not a man, he's a devil. But everyone, after everyone had their say, Brother Yoon continued, brothers, before we believed, we were all demons. Jesus received all of us. We need to have mercy and treat him as Jesus himself. The cell group changed their attitude and waited for Hawang to join them, just like they were awaiting a long-lost friend. The next morning, Hawang was brought to their cell Seeing him reminded Brother Yoon of the demoniac 
in Mark 5. His hands were handcuffed behind his back, and his ankles were chained together. He spoke filthy words, and he kept trying to mutilate his body by cutting himself with his ankle chains until his ankle bones were visible through the skin. He was ferocious and only 22 years old. If a person came close to him, he would try to bite that person's nose or their ear. He would jump up and down until his ankle bones were visible. In the previous cell, the, others pre, the other prisoners treated him like an animal. They would kick him and punch him and pour food on him. And he had not washed in many days. He smelled terrible. The cellmate said to Wong, this is Yoon. He's our leader. He's a Christian pastor. And then Yoon said to him, Brother Wong, we've all been criminals. Don't fear. We will take care of you. Brother Yoon had him sit, and he asked the others to give some of their precious drinking water that was only allotted once a day. They were given one cup of water each, the prisoners, for the whole entire day. And so he asked them to share half of their cup of water, and they filled a basin. And Brother Yoon tore off part of his shirt, and he dipped it. And he began to gently clean the, um, the blood and the dirt from Hawang's face and mouth. He tore part of his blanket off. And he, he disinfected his wounds with the only thing he had available, toothpaste. And then he cleaned them up and he, he bandaged them. And then when it came time for them to receive their food, their noodle soup or their portion of rice, they, um, they all said the Lord's Prayer, and they each gave half of their food to Brother Huang because he had been starved by the other prisoners and by the prison. And Brother Yoon fed him himself with, with a spoon. After they finished eating, they sang a simple hymn, and Brother Yoon began telling about our Heavenly Father's love. That night, when Brother Yoon began to eat his special little piece of bread that they, they gave him once a day, and all the other prisoners, he, um, he, was, he was starting to eat it, and he heard God say, what you do to the least of these, you've done to me. And he was convicted he needed to save some of this special bread and put it aside. So he wrapped it up in a napkin and he set it aside. The next morning when the prisoners um, were fed, each of the prisoners again shared some of their precious little bit of noodle soup with Huang. But Huang was still angry and he was still hungry. And he started screaming at the guards. And immediately, Brother Yoon heard God tell him to take the rest of his bread from the previous night and feed it to Huang. So he broke it up and he put it in his soup, in his soup and he started um, feeding the rest of it to Huang. At that point, Huang's stony heart broke. And he dropped off the chair and onto his knee, knees. And he wept and he said, Older brother, why do you love me like this? 
I'm a murderer. And I'm hated by all men. Yoon replied, it's because Jesus loves you. If we didn't believe in him, we would treat you like all the men in cell number nine. You should thank God for his son, Jesus Christ. And Hwang immediately began to pray, Lord, I thank you for loving a sinner like me. Judah was the fourth son of Leah. There was Reuben, the eldest son. Then there was Simeon and Levi, and the fourth Judah. His mother named him Praise. But Judah and his brothers were hardly praiseworthy. The dysfunctional dynamics of Jacob's two wives, Rachel loved and Leah unloved, concubines, favoritism, deceit, lack of fatherly leadership, and passiveness created friction, jealousy, rivalry, and a host of other problems. Simeon and Levi had taken revenge on the whole town when Dinah was raped. And the oldest son, Reuben, had had relations with his stepmother that disqualified him from the blessing. Then there was that fateful day that Jacob sent Joseph to his brothers. I'm sure that if Jacob had had any idea of how hateful and violent his sons were, that he would have sent a servant instead. Simeon and Levi, lean, mean, and angry, led the charge. Let's kill the dreamer. As he approached, Reuben said, no, we don't want, we don't want his blood on our hands. Let's just throw him in the pit and starve him. Secretly, he was planning to let him escape. So here they are sitting around eating supper that Joseph brought, and a caravan of Midianites is seen coming over the horizon. And Judah's quick thinking brought still a different outcome. Hey, guys, let's sell him as a slave. Let's get some quick cash. We won't be responsible for his death. So they sold him. Now, the going rate for a slave was 30 pieces of silver, but they were so desperate to get rid of him, they weren't in the uh, ability to negotiate very well, and they got 20 pieces of silver. But unbeknownst to, to Judah, he is now the salvation of Joseph and ultimately the salvation of his own family. He doesn't realize it. And of course, the news didn't go down too well with Pops. Pops' grief never ends, and the boys are stuck in silence. We aren't exactly told what precipitated the next event, but... In Genesis 38, we discover that Judah separates himself from his brothers. Maybe he wanted to tell Pops the truth, but the brothers felt there was too much water under the bridge. But for whatever reason, Judah moves out and he moves with the Canaanites. It's like the plan of salvation is in jeopardy. And he, he um, marries one of his good friend's daughters. And within a few years, they have three sons. His oldest son, Er, uh, when he gets of age, marries Tamar. And, but, you know, Er doesn't fall, fall too far from the family tree. He is so wicked that the Bible records that the Lord killed him. And so Judah says to son number two, Onan, 
You married Tamar, heir's a widow, and raised an heir for your brother. But heir doesn't fall too far from the family tree either. And so God kills him. And then Judah says to Tamar, you know, Tamar, things aren't going too well for you. Why don't you go home to daddy and tell you the youngest son, Shela, is grown. And time passes, and Shela's old enough, but there's no call from, the, from Judah, the father-in-law. And then the Bible records that Judah's wife dies. Word comes to Tamar, your father-in-law is going to Timnah to share his sheep. Now, you have to understand that sheep shearing time was partying time. And in the Canaanite religion, it was a time for cultic prostitutes. And so Tamar, she hatches this plan. She takes off her widow's garment. She covers herself with a veil, which would indicate that she's a cultic prostitute and that she's engaged. And she goes on the route that Judah will take to Timnah. Now, we don't know what Judah's thinking. Maybe he feels abandoned by God. You know, he's lost his wife. He's lost two sons. Um, he's estranged from his family. Um, but whatever the situation is, he further alienates himself from God by joining himself to a sacred cultic prostitute and she when he turns in she says to him what what will you give me i mean she's shrewd what will be my payment so he says you know tell you what i'll send you a kid from the flock uh, and she says uh you know uh, that's not good enough i need something that that's you know going to to have a little value to me in case you don't do this. So what he does is he takes off his signet ring. It's um, a cord around his neck, and it's, it's his stamp with his particular um, symbol on it. And he gives her his staff. Now, his staff, again, is, is kind of like an authority of who he is. And so he gives both of those to her as as a promissory note. And she, um, they, they have this relationship, and she immediately goes back home. And when she, Judah's friend goes back with the kid, now Judah doesn't bring the kid himself. He, he, he sends a friend to do this, you know, because he wants to appear okay. And his friend comes back and says, there's no cultic prostitute there. And Judah's confused, and, you know, he doesn't want to pursue the matter any because, you know, after all, his reputation. So, you know, he says, ah, oh, just forget it. But then, three months later, he hears that Tamar is pregnant, and he is angry. She played the harlot. She should be burnt. Never mind that he had recently been involved with a harlot. So she submits to the disciplinary measure and presents her assets when Judah comes. And Judah all of a sudden realizes he has been deceived. He realizes his infidelity to God he realizes that he's not given Shayla to be your husband. He realizes his own cowardice. He realizes that he's compromised the hope of the messianic seed. And so I believe this is the point where Judah <coughs> makes a turnaround and begins to repent. Because the next time we see Judah mentioned specifically in the scripture... It's as the brothers prepare to go on the second journey to Egypt. In Genesis 43, verses 3 and 8, he reminds Jacob that the man, 
warned us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with us. He made an ultimatum, we will go down and buy food if our brother goes. But, we will, uh, but if not, we will not go to Egypt. He says, okay, listen. We'll go down, but you have to send Benjamin. And if you don't send Benjamin, we're not going. He, he kind of takes the lead in the family at this point, which is really unusual um, because Jacob is the, the leader of the family still. And then he continues. He says, and this is where he shows his true leadership. He says, I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If we don't bring him back, let me take the blame forever. There's been this awakening in his life. And so they go back to Egypt, and they're reunited with Simeon at Joseph's house. It's the first time in years that all of the brothers have been together, only they don't realize they're all together. They eat, and they're tested by Joseph to see if there's jealousy. And I can imagine Joseph and his steward as they, as they plan. And he says, okay, you saw the order of the guys. Now make sure that the divination cut is in the youngest one's bag. So they leave town, and just as they're leaving town, the steward overtakes them. And he says, you know, my master is a wise guy, and he can, he can discern things, and one of you took the divination cup. And these men are so certain I mean, they've been bad men all their lives, but they're so certain at this time that none of them have done anything wrong, that they say to him, with whomever of your servants is found, let him die, and all the rest of us will be your slaves. I mean, it's, it's a pretty dramatic statement. And, and the steward says, no, 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 no. It's not going to be that way. It's just whoever sack, the cup is found, then that person will be my Lord's slave, and you guys can all go home and be fine. And, you know, I, I really wonder, I mean, why didn't they think of the money in their sack the time before? And so here, they all quickly just pull down their sacks, and each one of them, in the order of their birth, lines up, and they open their sack. There's their money, but no divination cut. The second one, oh, there's their money, but no divination cut. And it goes on down, and, you know, they're, they're beginning to feel relieved. I mean, you know, not, and they know Benjamin wouldn't have done it. And he opens his sack, and there's the cut. The drama has just come. Chapter 44, they all go back to the palace, and as they're, as they're gathered there before Joseph, and they bow down again to him, Judah steps up. It's not Reuben the oldest. It's not Simeon or Levi. It's Judah, number four. And he steps up, and he he steps closer to Joseph and he says to him, verse 25, my father said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons and one went out from me. And I said, surely he is torn to pieces and I've not seen him since. And Joseph hears what Jacob believes. And then he says something so powerful. He said, for your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, 
If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall blame the, bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please yet let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go back to my father if the lad is not with me? Lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. Judah, at this point, shows the greatest transformation in the whole story of Joseph. He offers to be the substitute. At this point in the story, he becomes a type of Christ who is willing to become a human forever for the redemption of mankind. And so as the years go by, as Jacob is on his deathbed, he gives a prophetic picture of their deathbed blessing, which will extend throughout all the generations. In Genesis 49, he says to Judah, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. That word again, Judah, praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you've gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now a lawgiver, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice, choice vine. He washed his garments in the wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. The lion symbolizes power and majesty and represents a king, even God himself. The lion pounces to catch the prey. He kills it and comes up victorious. And then he enjoys his victory. He's confident. He cannot be moved. Balaam, in his prophecy in Numbers 24.9, gives the same picture. It's a picture of not just a king, but a specific king, and Revelation 5.5 5 identifies the lion as Jesus Christ from the tribe of Judah. In the journey of Judah, Judah unwittingly becomes the salvation of Joseph as well as the salvation of the whole tribe of Israel by selling Joseph as a slave in Egypt. And Joseph at this time of revealing, recognizes that God has overruled that for good, for good, as he sees the divine plan and picture. Judah offers to be the surety for Benjamin, which is a type of the surety that the true lion from the tribe of Judah came to redeem you and me. It's a powerful picture. Hwang received a package from his father one day. It contained a shirt with the words written on the back of the shirt. I'm unable to see you now, but I will see you at the execution. Now what I didn't tell you about Hwang was Hwang was raised by a very um, rich and powerful family. Huang was baptized in prison, and what they did, they did the best they could in the circumstance. They, they, again, they each gave half of their water one day, and then he, the water was poured over Huang. A few days before his execution, he wrote a letter to his parents. The ink ran out 
of the pen that the guards gave him. So he bit his forefinger, and he used his blood as ink to finish the letter. And this is what the letter said. Dear Papa and Mama, I cannot see you anymore, but I know you love me. Your son has dishonored you. Please don't feel sad after I die. I want to tell you some tremendous news. I will not die, for I've received eternal life. I met a merciful man in prison, the respected brother Yoon. He rescued my life and helped me to believe in Jesus. He loved me. He cared for me and fed me every day. Papa and Mama, I'm on my way to the kingdom of God. I will pray for you all. You must believe in Jesus. Please allow my brother Yoon to share the gospel with you. When he visits you, he will tell you the rest of my story. May you receive eternal life. See you in the kingdom of God. Your son, Hwang. On August 17, Brother Yoon washed Hwang's feet in accordance to Jesus' command. And the next morning, when he was called out, he threw himself into Brother Yoon's arms and he cried out, I'll see you in heaven. A few minutes later, he was shot. The lion from the tribe of Judah has become surety for each of us. He is in the business of transforming us by the power of the good news and by the grace. Whether it is Judah or Hawang, or it is the proud or the poor, Jesus says, let me become a slave forever. Let me take the punishment. Isaiah the prophet wrote, surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. My prayer is that each of us will have that deep relationship with the lion, the one who took it all for us so that we can live forever.